To me, talent is actually the ability to immerse oneself in a lot of things that most people run away from at the first drop of a hat. You know, they don't want to have anything to do with it. Believe in yourself. Realers, I'm Olive. Welcome to the pilot, the official first interview of New York Real. Now check out my gear. This is London Real, a London Real hoodie from Brian, Brian Rose of the London Real. Thank you so much for encouraging me to start my own New York Real. Um, it was a, a joke in the beginning. I told Brian, hey, look, this is Olive. I'm from New York. <laughs> Check out my New York reel. And Brian's um, reply was like, hey, why don't you start New York reel? He said, send me a pilot, interview someone. No excuses. I'm gonna present to you my first guest. She was my first mentor, my acting coach my voice teacher and her name is Caroline Thomas. This is New York Real. I'm Olive. Today my guest is Caroline Thomas who is the founder and director of Toto Theatre Lab. You have been teaching acting for over 20 years. That's you right. have a special method of the integrated acting process. Right and you uh, graduated from the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. And then you returned to New York City and has produced and directed dozens of readings and showcase productions, often with combined, uh, combined cast of students and professional actors, and currently writing a book. That's right. You were the casting director for the feature film Anna, in which Sally Kirtland achieved an Academy Award nomination, as well as um, winning the Golden, Golden Globe Award. That's right. And you have some really successful students who went on appearing in big films and on TV, um, including Zoe Saldana right. from um, Avatar, uh, James Gandolfini from Sopranos, uh, Laura Preppen from Orange is the New Black and That 70s Show and David Duchovny from, of course, The X-Files. Right. <laughs> Welcome to New York Real. Thank you're you. my first guest. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm very honored. <laughs> <laughs> and Caroline, you're also my first mentor. And you oh. have helped me so much in acting and in speech. Well, you've done me proud. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's jump in. Yes. So I want to know um, a little bit about what you saw in your students um, when they were studying with you, mm -hmm. did you think that, say, Zoe, did she work particularly hard? The, thing about, the thing about Zoe is that she worked steadily. I think she's probably the most steady student I've ever had. She would just soak everything in, and then she didn't... I don't remember her asking too many questions. She would just... she listened. You can see that in her acting, too, that she's always listening to what the other, other people are saying. And she's a, she's a wonderfully, uh, she has an inner glow, I would say, and, it's, and it always permeates whatever she does. She always had that, and she just, she just worked steadily. She was already working when I met her. Mm -hmm. I met her through another student, Susan May Pratt, yes. um, who did some, some interesting work. Center stage. Yes, center stage. They were doing center stage together. That's that's how Zoe came out of that. Mm -hmm. And um, she just started taking classes like everybody else. I think the first time she came to my door, she was with her sister, um, and they were holding hands when I opened the door. <laughs> you know, she really had a lot of that um, quality from from the, coming from the Dominican Republic. She always kept that. I don't know what it is. Just her own center. 
And I always think that's very, very important to actors, is that they, they hold on to themselves mm -hmm. and work from themselves, and she does that. And then does all kinds of things with it. I mean, very, um, very varied um, characters that she plays. <laughs> Definitely an avatar, very, very different. Yes. That must have been extraordinarily difficult. I can't, I can't even imagine. And you mentioned uh, the, the foundation for actors. Yes. That, that is the difference between a would-be actor and mm -hmm. a real actor. Oh, yeah. I mean, actors work extremely hard. They don't talk about it. You know, they go on talk shows, and you'd think they're just sort of breezing through it. But no, they're not. They're doing an incredible amount of work to get ready to do the type of performances that make people want to see them. Whether they become stars or not is another matter. I, I don't know if stardom comes about because people are lucky in some ways um, or because they're really determined to be stars. I'm not sure about that. Um, my own mother was a star. Yes. Of course, she, uh, I was very young yeah. when, when she died, star. so I didn't, didn't have a chance to know her, unfortunately. I was four years old. But... Um, yeah, that's always a big question in my mind. It certainly is a combination of, of good fortune, and, but very, very hard work. Do you remember watching your mother, Alyssa Landy's film? Oh, when yes, you were yes, yes. I've watched many of them. Very big stars, you know, Cary Grant, um, Jimmy Stewart, um, Laurence Olivier. Actually, when he first came to this country, I have a letter from her to my grandmother in which she says that she's going to look after him and make sure that the agents don't take advantage of him. He gets a good agent. <laughs> yes, their, their, their film together was The Yellow Ticket. And um, yeah, I used to watch the, the films, but I couldn't get a sense of her, who she really was. You know? I, th I think films in those days were much more, there was more of a, what I call an actor's adjustment. You know, one might call it a facade, but it's not really a facade. It's an adjustment. Mm -hmm. But she was always herself, too. <laughs> and did you want to act, or did you want to also direct and produce? No, I wanted to act. Too. I never wanted to do anything but act. It never <laughs> occurred to me I would do anything but act. And, and teach. <laughs> well, I never wanted to. I never thought of teaching at all when I was young. Um, my mother was also a writer. She published six novels in her short life. She died when she was 44. So she was, and, and they're very interesting, very um, deep novels. I mean, they're not, they're not sort of, you know, she's not writing about herself, I don't mm -hmm. think, just sort of as an actress. And that's, I don't think there are any actors in most of her novels. Um, but she, um, I wasn't interested in the writing part. <laughs> of course, now I'm very interested in it. But, um, yeah, I always thought I'd be an actress. Of course I was going to be an actress. There's no question about it. <laughs> and, you know, I was for a very short while actually an actress. Um, but, yeah. How else, how else could I think? I'd lost her. I was going to recreate her in myself. <laughs> and um, so you went to London to study theater. Yes. Yes, I yeah. did. I... Um, how was the experience in that? Well, uh, it was very interesting. I'm sorry my cat is scratching at the door. Yeah. We're going to have to put up with this. <laughs> I'm so sorry. He's a maniac. I love him to death, but he's, he's a, a maniac. He's a part of this. <laughs> yes. He's, his scratching is a part of the interview. Um, yeah, I went to London. I always wanted to go to Europe, desperately. Um, but while my grandparents were alive, that really wasn't possible. We had to sort of make sure they were all right, and my father was teaching at a university, and... It just didn't happen. So I think I was 19 when I went to Europe. And I first went to France for two years, and that was fascinating. Um, I lived in Aix-en-Provence, and then I lived in Paris. And um, I had a boyfriend who was a musician, a, a very uh, concert pianist. So I got to go to the Centre Américain and listen to all the avant-garde music. So then I went off to England. I actually went there to audition. And I worked with a wonderful um, coach there, Barbara Francis. And um, that's an interesting... Oh, I forgot about that. I worked with Helmut Berger 
on my um, coaching, in my coaching with her, and then I went on an audition for Rada, Helmut Berger was in all those Visconti movies. He's a very, very famous actor but from a while ago. I think he died of AIDS, unfortunately. Anyway, so yes, I auditioned for Rada and I got in, and um, <laughs> it was a very mixed bag for me. Um, Hugh Crutwell was, had, I think, just taken over the directorship of the school. And um, he was, I think, trying to shift things around. It was a difficult time. And um, he said, actually, that Americans had a hard time there. Really? And it's very interesting why. And I understand that now when I got into teaching acting and began to realize. Because in America, our culture is very, all our cultures are very diverse. We all come from different backgrounds. Yes. We do not have an agreed upon set of prejudices, actually. We sort of all have different ones. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they tend to be sandpapered uh, more quickly and start to disappear more quickly than they do in other countries, I think all over the world. So in England, it always seemed to me, and I may be wrong about this, but I think that class has always been really the big one in England. Mm. There, there isn't the kind of prejudice, racial prejudice that, that we have here um, more of. Um, it's, it's just a different, a different approach to life, the ordering of life. So when Americans go to a school like Rada, which was very, very traditional in those days, we were very confused because we really needed to do method work. <laughs> because we could only center in ourselves. We could not center in the, in the ideas of the collective um, group. How many of your classmates are American? There were two, um, two boys, two young men, and one Canadian woman. They did okay. They were all right. I got very confused because, unfortunately, I, I'm like a mole. I burrow and burrow and burrow into things, and then I crawl very slowly through them. I'm not fast. I don't pick up things quickly. And I remember in my first um, test, as they were called, at RADA, I was playing Olga in The Three Sisters. I got hung up on, she uses these, she's a teacher, and she has exercise books. I really got hung up on what those exercise books looked like, what, because I was used to blue ones, you yes. know, from Barnard. And I, I wondered what color they were, what, you know, the Russian writing, all of that. And I just got lost. And I was terrible. I was a terrible student. I didn't understand anything. I, I had a very hard time there. And I was very, very uh, cast down about it, I think. You know, they were, they were nice to me. They mm -hmm. graduated me and all that. But it, wasn't, it was not the experience that, that I, one hoped it would be, you know. So... And uh, would that be why you returned to well, America, returned to New York? It was because I returned here because I knew that I had to come home to be an artist. I could not be an artist abroad. Maybe I could have later, if I'd ever been able to afford to go abroad, but because I love Europe. I love England. I love France, um, Italy. Germany is very interesting, but I, I stayed here. And again, I was burrowing into the work. You know, when I came back, I had to um, take a lot of other acting lessons, which, by the way, did not work for me. I learned from them, but I still wasn't any good at acting. <laughs> so can you tell us? <laughs> That's a terrible actress. Tell us, how, how, could you, um, how did you um, came up with the integrated acting, acting process? Uh, pure desperation. I, I, I wanted to know how to act, and I think that this had a lot to do with my mother and her death. Um, I thought I could get to know my mother, maybe. My whole objective in life, I think, has been to somehow reconnect, because she was so famous, and that whole side of my family is very, it's very complicated, and it's a whole different world. She was um, Austrian and German in her background, mm -hmm. and... Um, I just wanted to know about her. And I think deep, deep inside me, you know, and I am an artist, I'm not an actress. I think, I hope I'm a writer, really. 
um, and a teacher. And I think if you're teaching art, it's probably a good idea to understand what you're doing. In some ways, more than the people that practice it, more the, the you have to have a more of an intellectual grasp. And I'm mm -hmm. not an intellectual, but I'm, I'm sort of intellectual about my art because <laughs> I think it's a part of it. Um, so I, I did some, you know, different plays and different things here. Um, and maybe we'll talk about those later or something. Mm -hmm. But I, um, I started out with the Meisner work when I came back. Um, I, I started with Mordecai Lawner from the Neighborhood Playhouse. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful teacher. He just died recently, sadly. But, um, and, I, and again, I was a very dutiful student. I met my, my husband there, actually. Um, I married two other people in between, but <laughs> I met him there. And um, the Meisner work is very, uh, it's very much about the other person. And um, you have to really deal with your environment and with what's going on right in the moment with the other person yes. and other people. And that was very good for me because my tendency is to work more in the area of method acting. That's my, a little more of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And my method, method work I've done by myself. And I have sandpapered the edges of method work. I've made some very specific changes that I think perhaps fit um, acting students today. They're more... They're more um, calibrated to work with with people in our society now. And also, I've been teaching people from all over the world, like yourself. And so in America now, we have to really take in, um, you know, people from all over the world. I mean, Asia, uh, Europe, um, South America, a lot of people, the islands, you know, everywhere. So I... Um, I would do a lot of work lying on the floor, actually, by myself, doing vocal exercises, physical exercises. Then I began to get involved in the Grotowski work. Um, I started through, um, well, actually, a man named Jacques Schwat, who was um, Jerzy Grotowski from Poland, mm -hmm. the great Polish director. Um, he, Jacques was his interpreter. Because he used to speak, he was Polish, but he spoke French. So Jacques would translate into English. And, and then I met Andre Gregory through Jacques. And he was a tremendous influence on me, too. And then I started to work with my body and my voice. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not very physically inclined with my acting. Um, I exercise every day, and I have for many years. But it's always an effort. I, I don't do it easily. Um, and I think it's extremely important for actors to get into their bodies and their voices. I mean, a voice is a part of the body, yes. too. And, and to be connected. Right. So I did a lot of that. And, I remember um, watching uh, Grotowski's interview, mm -hmm. and he mentioned total. Like, of course, it's the um, translation of it, a total theater. Right. And I always right. wonder if that has to do with Well, that has to do the with the name. Of course. Theater. It sounds very pretentious because my, my little my tiny deal... But it is, it's a totality of what an actor has to um, deal with, you know, in their own life and then also in what's around them. So, you know, so, so that became very much part of my work. And then also <coughs> Stella Adler work, actions, subtext, um, doing a lot of research on the character, all of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm you know, became very, very much part of my toolkit, I guess you would call it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been trying to think about names for the book and the integrated acting um, process. It sounds so, you know, sort of intellectual and fusty <laughs> and all of that. So my other title so far is yes. the um, Stick It All Together Acting Book. <laughs> So, yeah, so I thought I would get away, you know, from this mm. very, very kind of um, pretentious intellectual stuff. It's like, <laughs> what? And then you immediately want to start reading. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I would use that as a subtitle. Mm. So it's pretentious to begin with and then very not And I know you have a blog called oh, Alting yes. the Actor. Yes, yes, I do. And my blog is actually the basis, well, 
I'll use it in the book. Um, I don't know how much of it I will actually end up on the page, but it's, it's, it helped me to organize my thoughts and to have to really put them down. And you know something? My blog is the best thing for getting students because the people that find me through my blog actually know what I do. And what I do is, is you know, not for everyone by any means. So <laughs> You have to be committed and ready to be open. To... Yes. I mean, commitment is definitely part of it. But, but the other thing is you have to be able to. You know, people talk about talent. And I don't think that I have a conventional idea of what talent is. <laughs> To me, talent is actually the ability to immerse oneself in a lot of things that most people run away from at the first drop of a hat. You know, they don't want to have anything to do with it. But a lot of it has to do with one's own background and the things in your background that you don't want to deal with. And you have to... Uh, why is that? Well, because... Um, this is my belief. It's, it's, it's an odd idea, but this is what I believe. That during your very early years, up to the age of about five or so, and, and this has been borne out through my students too. This, I've definitely seen this in almost everyone that I've worked mm -hmm. with seriously. Before you actually use language very well, a person is not able, a child is not able to screen. You can't, you can't sort of push away a lot of things. So in that period, you become aware of what you have to deal with. And at that point, your objective in life is formed. Um, you know that you want to, um, you know, depending on whatever the situation is, if, if your parents are going to get a divorce or have some kind of terrible problem, it's already starting. Wow. And, and a small child sees that. Obviously, if a parent dies, this is huge, because you're always going to seek that parent, whether you know it or not. I mean, for years of my life, I never really felt much about my mother. One of the reasons I did all of this was so I could feel about her, because I didn't. Mm -hmm. I, I just, um, I actually felt that my mother had left me. Um, that's what I actually believed that she had just taken off, even though I knew she died. I guess I thought that I was too much and she died because I was, I was taking too much energy away from her or something, I don't know, but it, it wasn't conscious. I just, I just separated myself, but that was very bad for me because I, can, I, I talk about living my life on a shelf. I wasn't in myself. And, of course, doing all that body work and all of that was terribly important to get into myself, too. So the Grotowski work helped me mm -hmm. with that. But I really think that everyone has an area that needs to be um, investigated to be an actor. They really have to go into it. And then that is their spur for their own personal objective in life. That's the way they find their objectives and their characters. And I know that's not, people don't really think that way very often, but that's, that's my, my belief. And it's borne out with almost everyone I've worked with that's continued on and done, done anything. I really work. enjoyed doing the sense memory exercises. We spend yeah. uh, what, most hours, of the time like, on 20 minutes, 30 minutes on the floor, and yeah. we just focus on each sense, each sense, like what do you see, what do you taste, what do you smell, what do you can you feel right and uh and personalized remember, personalization too yes people yeah. remember you had me look into my childhood and i saw the park and yeah. then i envision uh, try to see more and more of what was in the park right I remember yeah. seeing things that i did not remember right knowing right. like a seesaw somewhere that oh i used to do that yeah yeah and all that actually leads to something it's interesting because in your case, you've gone on more to do something like this, where, where you're, um, you're not exactly acting. You're a little bit outside watching other people doing things, you know, more like being a reporter or something like that. 
I see you doing that. Well, also you're a singer and you perform with singing. You know, so that's that's part of that's part of acting. But if you go deeply, deeply into acting itself, and you have to play all these complex characters, and it, you know, it's interesting because people think that you know you have to do something like Shakespeare or or some very deep film acting or something um, to be to be a real actor. That's not true at all. Commercials are extremely demanding. <laughs> you can't do a commercial unless you can make the copy mean something or have an expression on your face that's coming from somewhere. And that's not easy to do. I remember um, you taught us when you're talking to your partner, your partner is always someone to you, someone in your life. Oh, yes, yes, very, very important. Yeah, there are different levels of sense memory, too. There's the very, very basic stuff. Uh, which is the early childhood. And then, of course, there are all the things that happen in your life that, that are reflective, reflections on that early time. Can you talk a little bit about playing yourself and being yourself? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a really important thing. Um, you know, I method has a bad name for a lot of reasons. Um, method acting. People think that it's, you know, navel gazing <laughs> and, and you become very inner and, and, and internal and that's true if that's all you do yes but it's really about tracing what things that what what you feel something about because I'm not going to have the same set of things that you have I'm gonna feel about what I feel about and I need to be anchored in my feelings. So when I am acting, playing, I'm playing myself only in the sense that, let's say that I have to play um, someone who absolutely hates her mother. How am I gonna do that? You know, I can't, my mother died. I don't know anything about it only because I realized how much I loved my mother, eventually through these exercises, could I then figure out where hate would come from, because mm -hmm. hate comes from love for actors. It's when something that you love turns on you. And then I can understand, if I know how much I missed my mother, this is very complicated, I know, <laughs> I mean, not too many people are interested in it, but this is true in life, too. Yes. It's not just for actors. You know, this, this is for everybody. Of course. I ended up telling my grandmother almost every day that I hated her and then telling her how much I loved her. My grandmother was stoic. She was wonderful. She was extremely patient. She did not enable me, and I think the world of her now, now that I've done all this. But in those days, I hated her because she wasn't my mother. Mm. That's all. That was the reason I hated her. And I knew enough unconsciously about my mother to know that I would have a different life with my mother. So being myself would take me into something that I could never handle for a character. It would be far too big, far too, too unwieldy for me. But playing myself, there's a cutoff. Either I'm improvising and it's going to be finished in a little while, or I'm playing a finite character who has a lot of other things going on. The actions that I'm going to play are not the things I would do. My subtext is very important. Um, it comes from me, but it changes as I do research on my character. Um, it's a different time, place, you know, all sorts of things. The circumstances mm -hmm. change it, but I'm anchored in myself. And I, I see us using the same... Uh, tactic or, or thinking about uh, ourselves the same way in real life. Yes, yes. Well, I've, most of the people I've taught do not become actors. And I think that that's true of many acting classes. You know, very, very few people in this world are actors. Many people want to act, and it's fine for them to, to get the technique and to learn about it because it, it, it will help them. I think it's one of the most freeing and opening Yes. You know, disciplines that you can, you know, like dance or art or anything. I agree. The first class I had with you, I was in tears. I was crying. 
Really? Because, I've forgotten that. Yeah, that was the, a speech class. Right. Because, like, we were so busy, I didn't even take a moment to look inside myself. Right. Like, it's all of a sudden, today, this hour is about me, about what's in here, what's in here. Right, right. right. You know, I was just working with someone yesterday, teaching voice and speech, which I don't do much anymore, but I love to teach mm. it. This woman had been studying acting with me and couldn't stand it. She couldn't do it. It was too, too upsetting and overwhelming. So she came back to me to do voice and speech. Oh. And it was very emotional for her, but, but she's been studying singing. And it was something that was very much something that she could do right now. And she was very happy about mm -hmm. doing that because she wants to change her accent a little bit and she wants to be able to free her voice and get it out. And you, you had, it worked very, very well for you, I remember. <laughs> you had me talk less nasal but more uh, engaged and connected here. and and you're very easy to understand and we did all those uh, uh, yeah exercises. loosening the jaw <laughs> right right yeah freeing the voice yes yeah. i did remember calling you one day um doing laundry or something when i was i was like hey caroline thank you for giving me a voice <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know you were. You were I wonderful. I just realized I had a voice. <laughs> you you caught on very quickly. You you were really fast. You came in the third class, and you were your voice was already out there because you did the work. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was it. Yeah, to to be self aware. Yeah, I mean, I get so upset with people because they don't do the exercises, and then I realize. They can't even approach them. They don't even know. I mean, it's easier if it's voice and speech. But the acting exercises, I've had students who studied with me for a year. They just, they don't even know how, because it's based on meditation, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. It's meditative. And they, they, don't, they can't get into that zone. It, it's not right because, for them. You know. um, maybe when they're busy with school and work and they need to switch gear and really focus to... It could be thing. that, but I think most of the time acting is not for them. Because if acting was something they wanted to do, they, they can do it around almost anything. Hmm. They really want to do it, and this work that I do is right for them. I mean, I'm sure there are other ways of doing it. It's just, just my way. <laughs> my way. And uh, you have a, a young student, Devin. Yes, Devin Druid. Oh, yes, just about to appear in... A wonderful film by uh, Joachim Trier um, called "There There Will Be Bombs." He is the absolutely total star of this show, but it's very interesting because you can't find him in the publicity because Gabriel Byrne is in it, Isabel Huppert, and Jesse Eisenberg. So of course, in the advanced publicity, they're the ones that are going to be. <laughs> but this this boy carries the film, and I think he's the poster on the poster. So. And how long has he studied with you? He's, he studied with me, let me think about, it started about two years ago, and let's see, the first project was um, the thing that Frances McDormand just did. Oh, what's that called? Um, written down here. Um, sorry about this forgetting names, it's the cancer okay. medication. Oh, where did I write that down? Um, I included. Oh, Olive, um, Olive, um, Kittridge, Olive Kittridge, oh, yes. that's what it was, yeah. Um, that, was a, that was the first thing that I worked on, and a couple of other projects that he auditioned for, and then this, this incredible one came along, and he did an audition for it. This is this a case in point of some of the things I'm talking about. When he, um, he did his first audition, he'd already done it, and then he came in and he worked on it with me, and... He was a little bit disconnected from the material. He was very good, but it wasn't quite right. And I asked him a question, which of course I can't <laughs> divulge, but I asked him a question about his life. And I have never seen this in my life. There was a total transformation. It was as if he, something like this had happened to his face. Just suddenly everything changed. And then he did the, the scene again and it was perfect. Because he was able to grasp, he's a young, you know, he's only mm -hmm. 16, and he was able to grasp everything at once. I mean, I think he's really a, a genius, you know, he's, a, he's going to be a great, great actor. So. And then he got the part, 
So that was nice. You know, and, and occasionally I coach him. I see him. His, his mother, you know, brings him here from, they live in Virginia. His brother is a wonderful actor, too. Mm. Aiden Fisk, he's really, really good, too. I think they're both. That's one of the reasons it works so well, is that the, both of the boys are really good actors. And they don't compete with each other. They just, and their mother's just wonderful with them. So you have younger students, older students. I do. All walks of life. All walks of life. <laughs> every, and every, every part of the world. Like, sometimes I, when I watch Laura, Laura Preppin. Right. And, uh, and even James, James Gallagher, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I could see that there are moments in their faces. I was like, that's a Caroline moment. I know <laughs> what they're, they're doing something inside. Yeah, Laura I worked with for a couple of years. And um, I was her first acting teacher. And she was, um, she was modeling all the time. It was that period when, what, the grunge period. And it was so funny because she was only 15 and 16. And she, she would appear, you know, with a, sort, of with a, sort of a black eye or something, her hair all messed up in some <laughs> outfit. It was very funny. Looking, you know, like 25 <laughs> at least. And she started there, yeah. Yeah, she did. And um, again, you know, it was a family thing. Because her mother would take her around and all her sisters would be there. And I worked with her brother afterwards, too, you know, when she went to Hollywood. But she, um, she just, she had a great deal of freshness about her. A lot of, she was very inquisitive, extremely intelligent. She'd already been living in Italy, modeling. I think her sister went over with her. Um, and she had... She had a really strong connection with herself. Um, she was really young. And, um, you know, she, I could just see that she would, would do something. Uh, she went on a lot of auditions. Um, and then this thing, it was called Tumbleweed something or other. What turned into that 70s show had a oh. very fun. I still have the, the script here. Her and, audition. Yeah. And I remember that day she auditioned for that. And she auditioned for a film that I was very interested in. I was, I was trying to push her towards the film, <laughs> and she was really interested in this tumbleweed whatever. And then she, and she got, got it. it. And she got it, and off she went. And the rest is very much history. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful success story with her. Um, James Gandolfini, I didn't work with him for a long time, but I think it was a, a, a formative period for him. I um, can't remember how I met him. He was in my class. Yeah, I think his agent came to your class. Yes, his agent, yeah, um, Mary Collins, who was with Barbara Harder, which is no longer around, but they worked with elite models. Paulina Porskova was, was one of their people who was in that film that uh, Sally Kirkland did mm -hmm. on it, that film. She was the other star in that, the young, the young love interest. But um, anyway, yeah, my class... Um, it was interesting about James, he was good. You know, it's a funny thing about people that become great stars. You do not necessarily pick them out unless they're very, very young. Laura was young, and I think she was so beautiful, but you, you don't know where they're gonna go. Ambition may also play a part. Um, Laura was pos very well positioned, she had a very, very good manager that did that for her. I know James Gandolfini was ambitious. Um, he was ambitious by default, I think. He just mm. had to move forward. He had to. His whole life was um, predicated on doing his work, I think. I mean, I'm sure he had a personal life, too. I read a few articles about him after he died, things I didn't know about him, but mm -hmm. I wasn't surprised by, by them. So in my class, yes, Mary Collins spotted him and signed him. And then, at that point, nobody knew anything about him at all. He was absolutely nowhere. I mean, he didn't even have an agent. And, um, but he had, I think there was a woman who did some casting who, who was on his side. And Mary um, submitted him for A Streetcar Named Desire, the one that Alec Baldwin and um, Jessica Lange did. And he went up for a part of of a, one of the card players, but he auditioned with the part of Mitch, which he eventually played. And I remember this woman, he brought this woman here with him. 
we were working on it um, with this person that I think was a casting person, and it was that's when I began to see what what he could what he was capable of. There was something in his work. Suddenly, I saw him lock on. And you know, it's it's a strange thing to say, but I was aware of the desperation. Mitch's character is very desperate in Streetcar, and he just got it, you know. And I'm sure that's why he got the part, because they knew that eventually he might go on for that character. In those days, I think Broadway was a little bit different. And, um, you know, someone would go into a character. They would bring in, you know, another star from California. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of stars on Broadway doing acting now, which is great, because it's bringing, bringing it up and more people are going, and that's good. Yes. And, that, and then he just went on from there into The Sopranos and into his life which unfortunately wasn't long enough. But he did a lot of great work. But I saw the sadness. Mm -hmm. I just, it was unmistakable, and I saw that that... And I think, you know, with people that die young or, or have some of the problems that he had, they're burning rubber. That's always what I think. They're not, you know, like a car goes like that and it burns rubber. I think they're... They tend to be being themselves. I mean, they're putting a lot on top of it, so you don't think that's just James Gandolfini or something, but, or Philip Seymour Hoffman, or Heath Ledger, or any, mm -hmm. and certainly not Robin Williams, but you don't have to do that. I, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, um, someone just told me that he had a breakdown when oh. he was playing Hamlet. I didn't know that, because he certainly puts in 200%. Oh. Gabriel Byrne is extraordinary, too. I mean, I... I don't want to get into naming people because there's so many marvelous actors and I can't even remember names anyway. <laughs> um, but, you know, there and, and Javier Bardem is one of my absolute favorites. I think he's a very great actor. Um, but there's so many that are wonderful. But one has to be careful not to burn rubber as an actor. You, you have to switch on and switch off. Mm. And that is part of the difficulty of being an actor and why a lot of people do it for a while and then they stop for a while and have babies or <laughs> do something else or become directors yes. um, a lot of the time. They get behind the camera. So, so um, what are your favorite theaters or plays to see? Uh, oh, well, oh, I, places. I like new work. I, I, like, I like things that are... Um, you know, I just, just wrote a list down here because of my memory problems again. Um, I just saw a play called Posterity at the Atlantic Theatre Company that I liked. It's about Ibsen. You know, it's oh. about his life. I thought it was wonderful. The Times wasn't so crazy about it, but I was. <laughs> I read the criticism every day in the Times, and oftentimes I agree, and oftentimes I don't agree with Times. You know, it depends. Mm -hmm. But it's most great. of the time I do. I do. Um, saw a wonderful play called Abundance by Beth Henley, who wrote Crimes of the Heart. Um, it's a, a, what, what one calls a feminist play. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm a masculinist and I'm a feminist. I, I don't think anybody will be happy until both sexes figure out what they're doing. But it's certainly true that women do trail behind. They trail behind in, in you know, in important jobs and I hope our next president will be a woman. <laughs> it's interesting, though, that we have an African-American president before we have a woman president. Yes. You know, but I hope he's, and I love him, and I hope he started a trend <laughs> in that direction towards, you know, having different people do it. But then again, you know, may the best person win, you know, the best, mm -hmm. you know. So um, there's a new play now called Small Mouth Sounds, which I'm, dying to see. It's, I, I don't even know who the writer is. I've been reading about, about it in the Times, and people hardly speak in it. That's oh. why there's small mouth sounds. And, you know, I love experimental work and, and um, you know, and then also just, just great plays, any great play I'd, I'd love to see. Let's see what else did I... Oh, there was a wonderful play called The Events um, that was about... Um, it's, it's from the Scottish National Theatre... There's a lot of their work done here and at St. Anne's Warehouse, um, Let the Right One In. They, that was also their, their theater production of what was the movie. Okay. You know, but it was magnificent. And I really loved the, yeah. the first. Um, I like both of them, the remake right. and the original. <laughs> the, the play is 
is so interesting wow. in its own right. It's so so different from film. I mean, theater and film have their place very much. Um, yeah, and I and I love films. I just love them. Um, <laughs> I exercise and watch films, so I'm. That was the best thing. I have an elliptical, elliptical. elliptical, and I just, that's what I do. And I've watched thousands of films that way. (laughs) I love documentaries. Um, Netflix is amazing. It's cheap, and and you get wonderful service from them. And um, they have everything. They don't have it on streaming so much. The stuff I I watch is is you have to order it, but it comes immediately. Mm -hmm. It's it's amazing. I watch a lot of foreign films, um, any actor that I'm interested in, um, their work, you know, I watch, and any subject matter, too. I do a lot of research from those films, you know, documentaries and things um, that give me a, a flavor if it's, you know, they may not be documentaries, but they have documentary elements to them. Um, I just watched a film, um, Violet, it's French. And um, it's about a woman that, uh, she was a very close friend of Simone de Beauvoir. She wrote a very important book that was very, very much about her mother and her own sexual life and all of this. It was extremely out there in the days that it was written. Um, and it's just interesting for me in, in seeing how women um, are emerging from the problems that, you know, we have, and um, men, how they are dealing with that. But to go back and sort of see that period, so it's good to watch a documentary like that. Um, I was, I really was extremely fascinated by the um, the imitation game. Oh. Yeah, because yeah. there's a lot of um, stuff in my life that, that had, well, I actually knew someone that was at Bletchley and, um, and was... Um, worked in the resistance in, in World War II, and there were some very interesting things in that film that I think may have been missed. Um, I don't know how they got past the Official Secrets Act, actually, because wow. it was a British film. So, you know, I was absolutely fascinated by that. And um, I don't know, I like... Um, I never can think of a film, you know, because there's so, there's so many. Actors, I'm a little better at saying this actor and that actor, but just interested in absolutely every every area. Um, a lot of I do a lot of research on Shakespeare, you know, in in, in film. Um, I watched Oth- Othello with Olivier. I had no idea. I actually saw it on stage in London. I saw that production, but watching it now. What year was that? That was in the sixties. You know, I mean, really, a long time ago. And for some reason, I didn't get much out of it when I watched it. But the film, the brilliance of the work, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. You talk about a culture. That mm-hmm. that attitude toward this man who was a Moor, it's not like our attitude towards African-Americans. It's something different. They didn't make fun of him because he was a Moor, but they made fun of somebody from Italy or somebody from Russia or something. I mean, it, it, that was not really what it hinged on. It really hinged on the man and woman and the customs. He killed himself, but he could not let her live. And think about what's going on in the world today. So, you know, if I'm teaching someone that has to to deal with the problem of, of, you know, Israeli versus Muslim or whatever, watching something like that is very informative. You know, I really, really encourage anyone, but Mm -hmm. actors very much to watch old things. (laughs) Old (laughs) things. Listen to old people like me and watch old films. So, um, you mentioned documentaries, and uh, you have been... uh, Oh Working yes, yes, yes. I am actually writer. yes. I have been being shot in a documentary. It has to do with my mother's family. Oh, it's a big story. And this writer, um, Nellie Allard, A L A R D. You can look her up on the internet. She has a best-selling book, a bestseller list in France. Um, it's called um, uh, "Moment, Moment d'un couple," and it means a, a, a time in, a, in the life of a couple. I don't think we 
have a phrase in English, I don't know what they're going to call it, it's coming out in English very soon. And it's an extraordinary uh, roman à clé. It's about a, uh, a, an incident that happened with the Minister of Culture. Um, there's, I, I'm sure there's some truth there somewhere. But anyway, Nellie was an actress. Um, she actually studied engineering first. Then she went to the um, Conservatoire de Paris, um, got her degree from there. And she worked a lot with uh, Henry Joglum, who was also a friend of Andre Gregory's, actually. She worked in a lot of his films. She was in a film with um, David Duchovny. And now she is deeply involved in writing a book. Uh, she's also wrote the screenplay for this pl uh, last novel of hers, but now she's starting to write a novel about my family, mm -hmm. and my mother is going to be a, a big um, character. She's even thinking of going for forward into the future from and maybe doing something about another book maybe that will go on with, with our family. But anyway, um, it, there's a huge mystery in my family. I may have or may not have Jewish background. Um, my grandmother claimed um, to be the daughter of an extremely important personage in Austria. Um, I don't know whether she was actually her child. I think that may very well be unlikely. Maybe DNA could, could do something about that. But I do think that she wasn't lying. I think that this, this very famous person did um, did visit her a lot and did put her in a lovely little chateau-like thing in Vienna and did bring her up in her teenage years and told her the stories about what was going on in the Austrian, the empire, you know, the emperor and the, that situation. Mm -hmm. It's very complicated. And I intend also, to, I like to write short stories, except for my acting book, which may also be something of a biography. I may go mm -hmm. into some of this in that book, too. And you write poetry, too. Oh, yes. I've written over 100 poems. I'm always writing, writing, writing. <laughs> I actually have an essay coming out in um, the Andover um, magazine, because I went to Abbott Andover, and so they accepted an essay that I wrote. I don't really send things for publishing because I don't have time. It's terrible. I should. Really How should we manage our time as creatives? Forget it. <laughs> Hopefully you'll get to a place where other people will manage it for you. You know, I've never been able to do that. Have priorities. Yeah, I can't do any of that. I just plunge. I love to cook. I go cook for a while, then I go, not enough writing at all. I must change that. Um, you know, teaching, Jalak. You know, trying to make a living from it. <laughs> so I have um, three questions here for you. Yes. Uh, the first one is, if you are to Skype or FaceTime with the 20-year-old Caroline, what would you say to her? Sorry, this is emotional for me. And I say this to everyone, believe in yourself. That's it. Believe in yourself. If you believe in something, you'll do it. It is the truth. It is the truth. Wow. That's, that's... That just came to it. me. I had no idea what I was... You, <laughs> you told me the question, but I just thought of that. That's what I'm talking about with the work. You know, if in the moment you come up with something, and that's all to do with my mother dying and everything, because she wasn't there... <laughs> hard to believe in yourself when your parent isn't there. No matter how wonderful your family is, my father was fabulous, but my mother wasn't there. <laughs> so anyway, what's, what are mm. your other questions? Okay. Uh, number two is, um, you know, we talk about how to balance our lives and the, the four important areas in our lives that we want to um, do great things in. Um, according to uh, Ty Lopez, who is uh, also my internet mentor, right, um, is health, wealth, love, and happiness. What do you, um, do you have any advice on any yes. of them? Yes. Don't leave out any of them because I've left out wealth 
and that's very bad to do. And it really, really screws things up. So don't leave out any of them. <laughs> um, what are they again? Um, health. health. Health is extremely important. Exercise. Exercise, exercise, exercise. And watch Netflix. <laughs> yes, and watch Netflix while you're doing it. And then there's love. Of course, love. Everything's about love. Yeah, nobody told us about you know, how to love, but we have to You have learn to learn. Each person yourself. learns. You learn by fighting with people that you love. That's how you learn about <laughs> love, I think. <laughs> and what's the other one? Uh, and happiness in general. Well, Yes. Be happy enough to continue on doing what you want to do. Don't get so unhappy that you can't. I mean, I, if that's not possible for people, then, then they don't. And I, and I never, never think that one should judge them. And certainly as an actor, you can't, because mm -hmm. you're going to play them. You know, if somebody's an alcoholic, hopefully they can go into recovery. But if they can't, they can't. So billing them for that is not. But have empathy. Have empathy. But yes, happiness is important. You have to have enough so you keep going. <laughs> okay. And have good friends like you. Oh. <laughs> um, what is your favorite memory of New York City, of you in New York City? You know, it's interesting. I was about maybe 10 years old. My father brought me to the city, which is the most important thing in the whole world. Where did you live back then? Oh, I lived in Massachusetts, which was beautiful and lovely, but I always wanted to be in New York. And I went to see Bertolt Brecht's um, Three Penny Opera. Lottie Lenya was in it. It was the original, you know, like the original people. And that was the most fantastic thing in my, my life. And I think that cemented that I would be doing work in this area. It was just so mysterious, and I loved the music, and... I loved everything about it, the strangeness. And it was my background because I am German and Austrian. Mm -hmm. and something spoke to me. And how old were you? I was probably eight to ten. My father was wonderful. He took me to see all sorts of things when I was very young, met all kinds of fascinating people. No, he was a great man. He really was. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. Thank you Thank so you much. For Thank you for the opportunity. Being my first guest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And uh, I'm honored. You're welcome to come back again to do a part two. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'll <laughs> go on forever. <laughs> yes. So um, I wish you success in the next thing you do. Thank you. Thank in, you. In completing your book. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Are you looking